So good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, after trying to resuscitate uh, some dead uh, mannequins, uh, we are going to less important things. So uh, it's a pleasure to cross uh, the whole world to introduce uh, Professor Daniel Rucker. Um, Daniel is a professor uh, of computer science uh, at Imperial College. Uh, he is currently the head of the department in, in computing. And, and he's been a leader of the medical imaging field during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, his CV is impressive, uh, a bit depressing for the rest of the humans. Um, the amount of citations, publications, each factor, et cetera, it is amazing. Um, the thing he's been, he's had a natural talent for creating trending topics. I mean, he has been at the very beginning of the development of some technologies uh, for several years. Uh, at some point, when, with non-rigid registration, also with image reconstruction, in particular on MR, and during the last years, obviously, on machine learning and deep learning. I mean, the lab he has at Imperial is arguably one of the best uh, research groups worldwide in terms of, of deep learning. So uh, he has contributions also in neuroimaging and cardiology in terms of application, that this is not uh, very common. And the thing is, his impact on, on our community goes beyond these uh, flashy publications uh, and citations. Um, nowadays, uh, in machine learning, researchers take for granted to, to have the codes shared, to try another architecture developed by someone else. But he was doing this 20 years ago already, being one of the pioneers for open science. Um, in the early 2000s, I was starting my, my PhD, and, and it was a non-rigid registration. And, and kind of there, was, there were some codes, really good mathematically, fluid registration by Christensen, et cetera. But it was impossible to code. Uh, these people didn't want to share it. And, at some point, there were some people with other techniques, apparently not so good mathematically. Um, obviously, uh, with um, with Daniel on board, but they developed a really nice interface that everyone could use. I mean, this VTK view, VTK and rec. So the amount of researchers that uh, were helped by putting this course open source, they save us a lot of a lot of time. So this was very, very, very useful. Um, the thing is, I mean, still uh, the most important thing for me is that he is a really, really good friend, a very nice person with a wonderful family with Julia as Navel. Um, still nobody is perfect. Uh, and he hasn't never been a believer on physiological modeling. Uh, I don't know what he's doing here, but uh, he is more uh, a data processing uh, guy. So, well, anyway, thank you very much for coming to find uh, a space in your crazy agenda and let us know about machine learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Thank you, Oscar, for the very kind introduction and for exposing me as a, as a non-believer in, uh, in, in physiological modeling. Um, which I don't think is quite true, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that uh, hopefully a bit later. So what I wanted to do today is give you an overview of uh, some applications uh, of machine learning for medical imaging, but also uh, show you a bit uh, what's going on under the hood so that you can understand some of the concepts we're using uh, in, uh, in medical imaging at the moment. And it's probably fair to say that machine learning has completely revolutionized uh, this field, uh, which used to be, uh, as Oscar said, quite, quite difficult sometimes to get into because you had to do a lot of engineering, a lot of uh, code writing, and now machine learning has really made many things much, much easier. So uh, I wanted to sort of start with a brief introduction about uh, what I'm going to talk about and what I'm not going to talk about. And uh, I guess you've seen uh, everywhere around you that m machine learning AI seems to take over the world and it in particular has had a huge impact 
in domains which are largely to do with perception. Um, so for example, uh, in robotics, of course, we need to make a robot sort of sense the environment. In autonomous navigation, we need to understand images and video uh, and sensor data. And similarly, in speech processing, we need to understand signals. So all of these tasks are largely perceptual tasks, and that's where machine learning has really uh, revolutionized the field. Um, you've also seen some headlines, not all of them uh, look always very, uh, very uh, um, sort of gentle. Uh, a lot of them are sort of uh, quite uh, also highlighting some of the dangers which we might face uh, uh, from machine learning AI. But perhaps in the medical domain, it's, uh, it's probably fair to say that the biggest impact so far of what we have seen in AI and machine learning has been focused on the on, on radiology, and, and I think that comes back to the point I was trying to mention earlier, that in radiology, a large part of the tasks a radiologist will perform are perceptual tasks. Of course, they then have to also go on and interpret the data, but perception plays a big role, and that's where machine learning uh, uh, has, uh, has had a uh, quite big impact. And I think if you see these newspaper headlines, you have to also realize that there's a lot of hype in this as well. So not all the problems are solved. Uh, and actually, probably the really interesting problems have not yet been solved. And some of them haven't even been uh, tackled yet. So let me make a, make a start. So I come from, uh, I'm a computer scientist. I'm in a computer science department. Um, and I wanted to sort of start off by highlighting some of the differences between AI and machine learning because we have in our department a lot of people doing AI and we have a lot of people doing machine learning and they normally never talk to each other. In fact, they actually don't like each other very much. Uh, they uh, have a lot of competition. So if you sort of talk to an AI person, they will tell you, you know, what I really try to do is of course uh, build machines which can perform tasks that are characteristic of human intelligence. And when you then ask them, so what are these tasks which are characteristic of human intelligence? Well, the first answer they often give you is, well, if you can play a game uh, better than a human can, that's, that's, perhaps, uh, perhaps human inter that's perhaps artificial intelligence. And it's fair to say that some of these games are, were used to con be considered completely impossible for a computer to play, uh, for example, like Go, and now we have actually mastered that part uh, very well. Uh, if you then go and say, well, what other things, uh, how could I measure this, whether I have an AI system, the other answer you quite often get, of course, is, uh, well, you perform a Turing test, uh, which was proposed by Alan Turing many, many decades ago. And he basically suggested, well, if you have a human on one side, uh, behind, uh, and then there's a curtain, uh, and the human can communicate to somebody else behind the curtain, but without seeing who that is, that person or that other entity can be a, a uh, person or a computer. If you can't make the distinction between whether you're talking to a computer or a human, then you would say you have passed the Turing test. Now, in the medical domain, of course, that really, if you really go down that line, what you should do is a Turing test with a clinician. So you treat a patient uh, once, or you, you basically make a test whether you can detect any difference whether the patient is treated by an automated system or by a clinician. Um, that would be the equivalent uh, of a Turing test. But it turns out to be really, really hard, and I think we don't really uh, are anywhere near to actually having A, a sensible definition of how to do this Turing test, but also B, uh, a system which could actually then uh, win this test. So in the medical domain, uh, the data you'd also have to interpret, of course, uh, is quite diverse. It ranges from clinical records, uh, genetics, uh, metabolomics, signals, and images. So all of that has to be integrated. So in contrast, a machine learning person will tell you, actually, you know what, I'm trying to solve a much more constraint problem, uh, I'm basically performing computational statistics. I have some data and I fit a mathematical model to the data and then I'm going to use that model together with the data to make a prediction. 
So in this context, your data are going to be your images, signals, uh, your genetic data, for example. And then your model is effectively uh, a mathematical encoding of all the assumptions you make. And actually, this is a point where you can also combine your machine learning with uh, other types of modeling, with uh, computational models, uh, with biophysical models. Of course, all of that can be integrated uh, into these models because the machine learning doesn't really make a particular assumption about what type of model I'm using. And then finally, I'm going to try to take an action uh, or I'm going to try to categorize the data in uh, or, for example, assign a quality score to that. So that's a sort of much simpler problem because I really have a very well-constrained situation of what I'm trying to actually solve here. Uh, and then um, if you look a bit more into what happened more recently in machine learning, then one of the sort of uh, um, godfathers of deep learning, Jeff Hinton, some of you might have heard that he won the Turing Award uh, this year, which is, I guess, in the area of computer science, uh, the uh, sort of Nobel Prize, uh, the highest award you can win. He said, oh, you should really stop training radiologists now. It's, it's pointless uh, to do this. And actually, if you go to one of the big uh, radiology conferences, RSNA, which is not a small conference, it has 40,000 attendees, um, AI, machine learning, is almost as big uh, as any of the traditional imaging modalities when you, when you go to that, uh, to that uh, show. Uh, however, one, of, uh, one radiologist who uh, uh, sort of has actually taken a more sensible view said, actually, I think the AI will not really replace radiologists, but what will probably happen is that radiologists who use AI will replace those who don't. And I think that's a much more sensible point uh, because a lot of things you can use machine learning for are tasks which are very tedious for humans. And uh, that's a very uh, interesting point of view. So what I'm going to try to do in the next sort of uh, um, uh, hour or so is, is give you an overview uh, of some of the concepts and then show you some applications. And I've try to uh, structure the applications um, sort of from bottom to top, where the bottom doesn't mean it's the least valuable uh, uh, application of AI, but uh, it's perhaps one of the easiest applications of AI. Uh, and I want to show you also why that's true. For example, if you use machine learning for image acquisition reconstruction, this is something we already use computers all the time for. If you go to a, a radiology department and if you ask, can I look at one of your images, then the art, what you're looking at is not what the uh, machine has actually acquired, it's a transformed, reconstructed version of, for example, your sinogram or your case space data. So we're already using computing all the time for this. Whether we use computing which is sort of informed by machine learning or not, is actually not a big step. The next group of steps, which I would sort of uh, uh, call image enhancement, interpretation, uh, quantification, are effectively all steps where a human looks at the images and tries to detect something or measure something. So these are effectively perceptual tasks. If you ask a radiologist, uh, why did you label this pixel as tumor or not, it's not that they necessarily have a very logical argument, they just have a lot of experience um, and their perceptual system will tell them this belongs to the tumor, this will not belong to the tumor. So this is something where machine learning is very, very good at and I think will have a big impact. And then the high level uh, task where you then make a decision about uh, the patient uh, requires much more reasoning and also uh, is much more where you would say you need to be more explainable. For example, you need to be able to tell a clinician why you have made a certain prediction or why you have made a certain diagnosis. So all these different tasks uh, are something which we can solve in, with machine learning. And perhaps for the reasoning task, we also need to go back to classical AI so that we actually have systems which you can actually interpret and explain. So 
I'm going to talk mostly about something which is called supervised learning, which tries to learn uh, to predict an output for a given input and is actually the area of machine learning where all the successes you have seen so far have been really uh, achieved in. There's another class uh, of machine learning called unsupervised learning, where you effectively try to discover patterns, reduce dimensionality. That's probably the most useful in the real world because you don't, you don't need annotated data. You don't need su human supervision for all of that. Uh, so that's, in practice, very useful, but actually we've made much less progress in this area. And finally, there's another area of machine learning called reinforcement learning, where you learn what action to take in order to maximize a reward, and that reward might be a delayed reward. So it might not be something you can observe immediately, and that is typically something you use uh, uh, if you, for example, uh, build uh, economic models or if you play games, for example, uh, where you don't uh, get the reward until you finally win the game, for example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk only about the first uh, uh, part of, 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 of this group of machine learning techniques, but there are many other machine learning techniques which uh, are worthwhile to look into. So let me then start with a, a definition of what I mean with supervised learning. For example, you might have a collection of images, and for each image, each image comes from a, a different person, uh, you might have a, a disease label, whether the person is healthy or has a cardiovascular disease. So you have one label per image, um, and then you uh, extract features from the image, uh, you put that into your model as your data, and then you can choose whether you want to uh, solve uh, or you want your model should be a regression model or a classification model. If you have categorical labels, you typically call this a classification problem. And then you optimize the model uh, by minimizing uh, something which we call a loss function. A different scenario could be where you're trying to predict an ordinal value for each image. For example, I might want to predict the age of all of these patients uh, from which I have images, in which case I can probably use a regression model instead of a classification model. Um, but I'm doing effectively the same thing. And it's important to see that this distinction between regression and classification is somewhat arbitrary. It's just a difference between whether I want to uh, effectively uh, make a prediction for an ordinal value or a categorical uh, value. Uh, perhaps a more interesting uh, application from an image analysis point of view could be something where instead of trying to predict a single value for each image, I might want to predict a value for every pixel in the image. Uh, for example, if I want to segment this image of the heart into left ventricle, right ventricle myocardium, I need for every pixel a label indicating which class it belongs to, um, and in which case I would actually have a prediction task where I'm trying to predict something for every pixel rather than for every image. This could be a categorical uh, labeling problem. Or, for example, I might want to predict how a SPECT image looks like based on the MR image uh, of that pe person. So I'm doing something which we call image synthesis. So I'm trying to synthesize one image from another image, in which case I'm trying to do the same thing as I described before, but I want to predict an ordinal value. For example, uh, the uptake value or the Hounsfield unit, for example, of a certain modality. So all of these tasks we can effectively solve with supervised machine learning uh, uh, problem or approaches. <clears throat> so how does a basic formulation look like for a, a supervised learner? Well, we need a predictor, H, which, uh, given some input, uh, input data, X, will make uh, an accurate prediction, uh, Y. So uh, it's a very simple uh, uh, function where basically you're trying to solve a function approximation problem. And in addition, we have a set of training data. We have a set of pairs from, I, uh, from 1 to m 
which uh, basically tells us the input, uh, the input features, and the corresponding output label uh, for those uh, input features. And then we do some magic, uh, and after uh, doing our magic, after doing our learning, we end up with this uh, approximation where for all the training set, uh, our uh, function h does a pretty good job, hopefully, of approximating the output uh, for a given input. And we assume that that will also generalize to examples which you have not seen. So if you think about this, uh, in this function h, there's this big theta here, which is effectively all the model parameters uh, I have. So all the degrees of freedom which I can change to fit my model to some data points. So if you really think about what I'm doing here, is I'm doing function uh, approximation. I have a, get, get a given set of data points and I'm trying to fit a function h to it. And the parameters of h are these thetas. So we call uh, h often uh, our hypothesis. Um, and then the question really is, what is our fundamental form of h? Now, if you're doing signal processing, you would probably say something like a spline. In machine learning, we have different names for this. We can use something called a support vector machine, logistic regression, naive base, linear discriminant analysis, decision trees, k-nearest neighbors, neural networks. All of them try to effectively do the same thing. They're trying to approximate this function I showed you uh, uh, on, the, on the previous page. And uh, in some sense, if you, for example, think about this in terms of classification, what you really need to do is, with the classifier, you only need to decide which side of your space, for example, uh, is, has a value of 0, which one has a value of 1. Uh, so I'm trying to effectively learn a decision boundary between uh, two classes. And that's the easiest form of this function approximation. And uh, Perhaps you can guess that these neural networks, which are sort of shown here on the bottom right, are by now the most powerful way of doing this, at least for perceptual tasks. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do here is in, in the next uh, slides is tell you a bit more how we can do exactly what I've shown you on the previous slides with neural networks and what you need to do uh, to do this efficiently. By the way, if you have any question at any point, please also feel free to interrupt me uh, at any point. Okay, so let's first of all start with some uh, brief history because it's probably worthwhile to realize that these neural networks are not something new. So the earliest papers really came out uh, more than 60 years ago on this topic. Um, and all the basic ingredients which we're using today have been known since uh, the mid-80s. So we know all the things uh, about neural networks. We've, been no we've known them for a while. What's really changed uh, over the last two or three decades is that we found more computational efficient ways of using these neural networks. For example, convolutional neural networks, which were invented by uh, Jan LeCun, who also won the Turing Award this year. Uh, GPUs, and then uh, more recently this idea that we need to make these dead networks very, very, very deep. And that's only possible if you have a lot of computational power. So all of these, what's on these slides, are effectively engineering tricks which uh, were required to make these neural networks work, but they're very important. And if you look at how they have changed the field, this is uh, a diagram showing you uh, the error which you have, which people have achieved on one of the most difficult sort of challenges in computer vision, the image classification challenge of ImageNet, where if you look at in 2010, the error rate which people were achieving with a huge amount of manual engineering was around 30%. And we have now, within five years, that dropped down to 3%. So the amount of improvement over five years of, of time has been absolutely staggering. And you see that these, uh, these approaches which people initially used were very, what we call shallow. 
they don't uh, involve very deep neural networks. Uh, actually, the first one using a neural network was in 2012 with eight layers. And the most recent approaches use over 150 of these layers. So the amount of complexity has also gone uh, significantly. So let's take a bit, a quick look into the basic ingredients. So the basic ingredients of all the neural networks you will see uh, are based on an idea called the perceptron, which is basically a simple computational block which uh, uh, computes a function f of x, where x is an input pattern, and the input wet pattern is weighted, uh, um, or each input to this uh, neuron uh, which computes this f of x is weighted by a weight w. And the output of the perceptron, the early perceptron, the original one, is simply one if uh, the summation of all these uh, weight, uh, weights times the input is bigger than a threshold, otherwise zero. So this is simply a binary output. Um, and if you sort of think about this, you can decompose this computation, which f of x uh, performs uh, into two parts. One is effectively this uh, 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 summation of all the inputs weighted and the second part we can sort of think of an activation which is either zero uh, if the value is below the threshold or uh, one if it's above the threshold. Very simple calculation. Okay. Um, good. So now, if you assume that you have a network which does exactly where every little block does this calculation, I can now build a bigger network, correct? I can take my inputs, I can connect them to all these neurons or perceptrons, uh, and I can build something which is called a multi-layer perceptron, where every uh, perceptron in this network does the same calculation, but of course the inputs will be different and the weights in this network uh, might be different. Okay? So effectively the parameters which I have in this function approximator are what we call the, uh, the weights. So ignore the B for now, the B is just a, a, a convenience term called a bias vector, it's just something we add uh, to every calculation um, and it's an, in, in, in theory another parameter but uh, you don't need to worry about that. So all the parameters are these w's which I can use uh, and I can change. So you can sort of think about this as a big machine which has a lot of knobs which uh, each knob corresponds to the weights and I can tune these weights as I like and I can observe what the output of the network is uh, given those uh, weights. So really learning in this context means we're adjusting the weights. We're adjusting the weights so that we minimize some loss uh, when we try to approximate our, our function. Okay? So the easiest way of doing this is obviously if, uh, if I don't get the right desired output for my network, let's assume I put an input vector into this uh, network, I observe what the output is, it's not what I want it to be, so I can try to change the output of the network by changing the weights a bit and ideally small changes in the weight should be uh, should also cause small changes in the output of the network because that's easy for me to handle. It turns out that this is not really the case. If I make a small change in one of the early layers I really get completely different results. So it becomes very very hard to to sort of do a trial and error uh, optimization of this network. And in addition, of course, if I have a big neural network, I will have many millions of these weights. So it becomes very, very hard to, to really optimize this. Okay. Um, now let's take one step uh, uh, back before we sort of look a bit more in how we can solve this optimization problem. In this perceptron, I've already told you that you decompose, you can decompose the calculation into a summation and into an activation. And that activation is actually biologically inspired, is what our neurons do in the brain. So what people have discussed is actually, well, why don't we use something which is more biologically plausible, for example, a sigmoid function. A sigmoid function 
uh, looks a bit uh, like this. So it's basically also thresholding our, our output, but in a much softer way. So it's a soft activation function going from 0 to 1. Um, and you can sort of see that if you're exactly, uh, the input to the, to the sigmoid is exactly 0, then you get an output of 0.5. If you have a positive uh, uh, a value of z, you get a, a, a higher value and, and so on. So I can effectively now replace this activation function by any function I like. And it turns out that the choice of that function is also very important. Not very important from a biological uh, point of view because none of these functions I'm showing you here are really what your brain does. But computationally, there's a big difference between using these different functions. Um, I won't go too much into the detail, but perhaps what most people these days use is what's either on the bottom left of the slide called a ReLU, uh, rectilinear activation function. So it's simply thresholding everything uh, below 0 to 0, and then just a linear activation function. Or the, what's on the top right, a leaky uh, ReLU, which does something very similar. Uh, it's just a linear function with a discontinuity. Okay? So if I now take some of these functions and put them into my network as activation functions, I can go actually back to the learning problem and uh, solve the learning problem much more efficiently. So let's assume that you have a loss function. So your loss function is just effectively for all examples you have the difference between the output of your network and the desired output. Um, I have my parameters. So I can uh, uh, formulate my, my, my loss function in terms of, of these parameters. And then what I can simply do is I can do gradient descent on my loss as a function of the parameters. Okay? And that turns out to be, even in very, very large complex networks, to be very efficiently possible. Um, I only need to be able to calculate partial derivatives of the loss function with respect to all the different weights. And I can do this very efficiently using a backpropagation algorithm. Okay. Um, so what I really do is then during my optimization, I compute my partial derivative and uh, I update my parameters uh, based on uh, a step in the gradient descent direction where alpha here uh, is what you would then call your learning rate, but it's nothing else than solving an optimization problem. And uh, that's effectively your parameter update for, for your neural network, okay? And so the only thing you need to uh, do is actually to uh, compute these partial derivatives. And it turns out that this backpropagation algorithm is a very easy way of, of doing this. Well, when I say easy, if you try to write it down on paper, it becomes horribly complicated. Uh, but the rules are very simple. It's just because the networks are so big, it becomes very complicated. If you try to code it yourself, it becomes very complicated. But one of the great things is if you have heard about deep learning toolkits such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, they all include something which is really a lifesaver. They allow you to do automatic differentiation. So you only specify L, the loss function, and it automatically calculates the gradient analytically for you for the entire network. And that's one of the big advantages and one of the, the really uh, things which have also transformed uh, our field. Okay? So if you want to look for more details, uh, 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 you, can, you should really have a look at, at those two references. Uh, and if you use PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, you normally never have to bother with doing this by hand. Okay? So really, everything you need to know about deep learning is on this particular, well, on neural networks, let's say it like that, is on this particular slide. You see the neuronal activation, your loss function, how you do the learning via gradient descent, and the activation functions. So this is your sheet sheet for, for, for neural networks, okay? Okay, so this is neural networks, and again, actually, People might have, actually, when I was an undergraduate student uh, in computer science, 
which is a long, long time ago. I don't dare to tell you how many, uh, how many decades ago that was. We're actually learning exactly this in, in neural networks. So none of this has changed over the last 30 years. Okay? So what has really changed is how we use this in deep learning. Um, and uh, I want to sort of highlight a bit how this changed, especially imaging applications. So we used to always sort of uh, engineer features which we thought are important for doing image analysis. And uh, already very early on, people recognized perhaps that's not what we should really do. Perhaps we can just learn everything end to end. And uh, many of you might have learned, uh, might have heard the term end to end learning, which is really what this refers to. So the traditional machine learning pipeline is I take my images, I do some operation, I extract edges, I extract something which we call sift features, hog features, texture features, and then uh, these features, I'm going to plug them into my classifier. And the real difference with deep learning is that actually I'm going directly from the images to the classification, which means that actually my function h also has to learn what are the correct features you should use for whatever task you're trying to solve. And it turns out that quite often we want a hierarchical feature description. And so you want low-level features, for example, edges, and then you might want to have high-level features which tell you something about concepts uh, or other entities in the image. And you can do that quite easily by doing this with new deep neural networks. So you can sort of think about each layer in the network as extracting one set of features. And the early layers will extract the low-level features, and the later layers will extract the sort of high-level features. And that's not by accident, but that's by what you will see in a moment, the design of the network by choosing certain, uh, 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 making certain design choices uh, for this network, okay? So let's do this with a simple example. I want to label this image. Let's say this is a 256 by 128 image, and I want to solve the problem, is there a cat in it or is there a dog in it, okay? Um, so let, let me just use a neural network. That's what I just told you is a good idea, correct? So you do this, but you end up very quickly with a problem. So let's assume that I want to connect every pixel to a neuron, um, and I have a 512 by 512 uh, pixel image. I end up with already a quarter of a million uh, weights just for that one, uh, for that one neuron, okay? And that means if I now have thousands of neurons, I have the quarter of a million weights for every for each one of these neurons. So that's not going to work. And people, when they were trying to do this, you ended up with billions of, of these uh, uh, um, neurons. Obviously, didn't work 30 years ago. It still doesn't work if you try to do it today. Then people also observed something, something else as well. Why don't I actually connect every neuron only to a small patch in the image? Okay? And if you do that, you, um, you end up with a much smaller uh, connectivity. For example, if it's a 10 by 10 window, you only have 100 weights. But it also makes, com makes sense in computer vision because, for example, if you look at this butterfly which the cat is chasing, you have no idea where that butterfly is going to be uh, in advance, correct? So that butterfly can appear anywhere in the image. And so what you should do is you should have uh, uh, a, a kernel anywhere uh, which can extract the same feature anywhere in the image, okay? And so what I can now do is I can uh, basically say, well, let me go one step further. Um, why don't I take the same kernel and I'm going to uh, have one layer in this network which has all the same connectivity. So if you look at this neural network, this what I've drawn here, is I have a lot of neurons and they're connected to many different uh, patches in the image. 
but they all have exactly the same connectivity. So they share all the same weights. So if you know image processing, then you know that actually what you can interpret this as is a convolution. It's basically like sliding a convolution filter all over your image. Okay? Um, and the output of the convolution effectively is a new image. Okay? So that new image is basically the output of your filter. The only difference to standard convolution is that I'm going to learn the weights of this filter. I'm not going to specify the filter a priori. Okay? And so basically you end up with a feature map, which is just another image. Okay? Um, I, mean, I, I hope most of you, are you all familiar with what a convolution is? Okay. So you can sort of, here's a mathematical definition of a convolution, but it's basically just a, a pixel-wise multiplication between the small filter, uh, all the filter elements, and the elements in the image, and I'm sliding this, this kernel across. Okay. So here's just sort of a standard textbook uh, example of what this would do to, a, to an image if you use different filters. For example, you can approximate, you can find horizontal edge, edges, vertical edges, uh, other types of edges. So by simply just changing your filter elements. Okay? So very simple. Okay. So let's go back to this. So we have this, uh, have this uh, output. And the most important thing to think about is that the feature map, which I'm generating, is actually just another image. Okay? So what does this mean if it's just another image? Well, let's have a look at this. So first of all, I can, uh, of course, I can only extract one feature using this method from the image. But what I can do is I can have another, another channel with a different uh, set of uh, 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 filters. So now again, all the red filters, they also share the same weight. So in this network, which I've drawn here, I still only have 200 weights, correct? 10 by 10 for the first feature uh, filter, 10 by 10 for the second one. And the output is another image, okay? So I can stack that uh, into another image, can add a third one, a fourth one, as many as I like, correct? So now I have this. But I can also view the output as, as, other Im as another image, as I've shown you before. So now what I can do is, well, let me take the output of the first filter, so the first couple of feature maps, and let's connect them to another layer in the network. So this is now my second layer in the network. And the second layer in the network will also perform a convolution, but will perform a convolution not on the input image, but on the output of the first layer. And the one thing which is important is that a convolution is now a 3D convolution, or a 2.5D convolution, where I'm convolving now over all the different channels in my feature map. So if you think about this, the first feature map has four channels, because it has four neural, uh, uh, four, four layers. Uh, sorry, not four layers, but four different uh, filters. Um, and now the convolution in the next layer is across all these different uh, four channels. Okay? And I can keep on doing this. Okay? Now you can design any neural network uh, uh, in this way, and you sort of can go deeper and deeper, as deep as you like. Um, and you have to stop at some technical uh, problems at some point. Okay. Okay, let me, let me briefly stop here, and I want to sh show you in a second how you use this for image segmentation. But I wanted to ask whether any of you have any questions about what I've done so far. No? Yes. Periodically, is there for the red networks, static feed drawing? Is there a feed drawing as well as the continuous? Continuous? So you can, in theory, keep going as deep as you like. Uh, there are two problems you encounter. One is memory on your GPU. How, how, how much memory do you have on a GPU? And the second thing is when you backpropagate your errors, you typically have a problem that your gradients, which you backpropagate, because you're constantly applying the chain rule, they tend to get smaller and smaller as you get through the network to the first layers. If you make your network very, very deep, 
you might run into numerical problems where they, all the gradients vanish, they all go to zero, and you therefore, you actually never update the first layers, correct? That's, that's one of the fundamental challenges. And that then becomes very important how you design, for example, your activation function. For example, the sigmoid activation function, which is biologically plausible, nobody uses because it makes these gradients vanish very, very quickly. Um, so it, it becomes a lot of engineering. But in principle, you can keep going. Okay. There any other questions? Yes. You could have collaborating networks. People have proposed something which they call sort of ensemble of networks where you have multiple neural networks. I don't I think most people use them more to make the networks more robust. I don't think they may they use them to make to extract feed because each each network in the worst case might learn the same thing. Correct? You need to do something which also makes sure that you're learning complementary information in each of these networks. So um, but there are there are approaches going in the di that direction. Okay. I guess that the more layers you have, the more you lose interpretability, right? Because it's very easy to understand the first layer. It's filters, everyone has done this in image processing. But the farther you go, and so these patches of rainbow yeah. color, okay, I mean, I don't want to imagine what is... It gets more and more abstract, correct? So. I think that's a very important point. So the, the early features are typically you can interpret them as edges or corners or whatever. That disappears, but on the other hand, for example, in a task like segmentation, perhaps you don't really care about interpretability because I can look at the final result. If the result is good, I'm happy with it. But, uh, but that's, that's a completely unsolved problem. Okay. So now let me show you how you use such a network for segmentation, okay? So uh, let's assume I want to label uh, uh, tumors in the brain or lesions in the brain. Uh, so what I can do, for example, is, okay, I can't deal with the whole image in one go because it's too large. Let me extract a cube, let's say 70 by 17 cube. Then uh, the first a uh, set of filters, uh, for example, if I choose my filters to be 5 by 5 by 5, the first output of the first layer is going to be 13 cubed. And do you know why it's going to be 13 cubed rather than... Set? Why does it not maintain the original size of the image? Anybody has an idea? Yes, because I have to handle the edges, correct? So I can only, my convolution is only really defined uh, inside, if I'm fully inside my patch. So, okay, so the, small, the first feature map is going to be smaller. Then the second feature map does the same type of convolution, but on the first feature map. So it's going to be smaller again. And what you see here is the feature maps get smaller and smaller. And ultimately, they end up as, as one by one feature maps. And then I can do something which we call a fully, fully connected layer where everything is fully connected and then I do my final classification. That's actually the first naive approach at trying to do this. And actually it's, there's nothing wrong with this approach. Um, um, and there are a couple of interesting observations which you can make. Um, so first of all, the feature map is shrinking. Um, I can also add something which we call a stride of a convolution. That means I'm moving the kernel not only by one pixel, but by, for example, uh, a factor of s. So I can actually make the, f the feature map smaller and smaller. Perhaps what's more interesting is if you look at the, the, the fourth uh, layer of the network, the pixel which you see here in the center, let me see whether I can show you this, this red pixel for which I make the classification, that receives input at this layer from this uh, 5 by 5 region, from this 9 by 9 region in the previous layer, from this larger one, and from this 
17 by 17. So what you would say is this pixel, for example, has a receptive field of 17 cubed because everything in that region, in that receptive field, can influence the prediction you're going to make. Okay? And that also tells you I'm a, that, that, for example, whatever classifier I'm using here will not be able to take anything into account which might happen outside that 17 cube patch. Okay? Um, okay. So now if I train my network, what I can do is I can sample a lot of these patches from my image. Of course, I need an annotated segmentation, so my training labels here. <clears throat> and then basically, I can update my network doing this. <clears throat> now it turns out that this is extremely inefficient, and if you try to do this in practice, it will work, but it's going to be super, super slow. And that's because you have a lot of redundant, <coughs> redundant information. Uh, you have to uh, do deal with a lot of overlapping patches where you have to recompute, reconvolve uh, your data many, many times. So this is not what you should ever do in practice. And if you ever try to do this, this will run for hours. Um, so there is one simple trick which people use is to try to get rid of this fully connected uh, layer um, which is typically at the end of these networks where you have small feature maps and you connect them to every neuron. For example, to neuron number one and to neuron number two. And these fully connected uh, networks mean that I cannot change the size of my input because I've hardwired uh, how I'm dealing with this. So what you can do, do is you can re express, re-express these fully connected layers through another convolution, through something which sometimes is a bit counterintuitive because you might even use something like a one-by-one one convolution, which doesn't really seem to make sense, but actually makes sense in these networks. So what I can do is I can express this last fully connected layer also as a, a convolutional layer, um, and then I might have a feature map which is just one by one large. But what you will see in a moment is it allows me to do one very important trick. It allows me to go from this network which you see here at the top where I have this fully connected layer to something uh, which becomes a fully convolutional network. So in this fully con convolutional network, every single layer is a pure convolution, nothing else. Okay? And it will have exactly the same behavior as the top network. But that suddenly allows me that at test time, I can choose my input to have arbitrary size. Which means that actually what I can do is, instead of using putting an entire patch of 17 by 17 uh, by 17 pixels in, I can choose, for example, uh, a much bigger patch. Put this in. And what I get out is a dense prediction, a prediction not only for the center pixel, but for all these different pixels uh, uh, at the center uh, of my patch. Uh, how many will depend, of course, on the network architecture, but now you're going to make a prediction for many, many pixels at the same time. And you can really uh, scale this to arbitrary dimensions. And that allows you to be extremely efficient uh, when you do this uh, at test time. Okay, so for example, here's just an example of this. If I show you the same example I've used to just do a prediction for one pixel, um, if I now change my input and make my input, for example, 25 by 25, then I'm going to actually end up making a prediction uh, at the same time with one single pass for a 9 by 9 block uh, in my image. Okay? So that's going to be extremely efficient uh, and, and much nicer. Okay. Good. Okay, so I can also use this during training. I'm going to skip this a bit because I don't think you need the, the details are perhaps uh, too important, but I can also use a similar trick during training. Okay. Okay, so Here's a very early example uh, of how you use this in practice. So this was done by one of our PhD students, uh, Kostas Kamitsas. 
uh, who came up with this uh, architecture called uh, DeepMedic. And um, uh, you can actually download the code for all of this uh, on his website. Uh, if you look for, if you just Google DeepMedic, you'll, you'll find his paper. Um, and you can actually download that code. It will optimize something you call cross entropy as a loss function for doing segmentation. Um, so that's a very simple loss function which just minimizes the distance between your desired output and your, your current estimated output, uh, in this case, uh, probabilistic labels. The one thing which he did, which is quite interesting, is he added two different pathways to the network. So perhaps that's actually a bit, of, a bit similar to what you were asking uh, earlier. Uh, and these two, two different pathways, they have a uh, different purpose. One of them takes the image uh, at its normal resolution, uh, for example, uh, at, uh, at a high resolution. Uh, and the other pathway actually takes a downsampled version as the input. And the purpose for this is that you actually get a much wider field of view. So you, for example, see much more of the brain if you're trying to segment the brain, but you're only seeing it at low resolution. That will give you some information the way you currently are in the brain. And that might help you with making uh, uh, drawing conclusions. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but uh, he has shown very nicely how you can segment some 3D brain MR images with this, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, uh, a bit later on. Okay? But I just want to show you that this really uh, enables you to do quite nice segmentations. So we're only missing one final ingredient before we can actually use CNNs for many, many different uh, applications. So you have already seen that uh, I can reduce the size of my feature maps uh, because I have to handle the boundaries in my, um, in my convolutions. But I can also reduce the size of my fe feature maps uh, more, more aggressively by something which people call uh, pooling or downsampling. And here's an example, for example, what, what I can do, for example, I take my feature maps here, let's say they're 224 by 224, and I'm simply averaging or I'm pooling uh, uh, every four by four pixels in my feature map into one single pixel. So that's simply a downsampling operation, correct? The nearest neighbor downsampling operation or uh, an averaging downsampling operation. And what's the purpose of this? Well, that makes my feature map smaller, but it also creates a bottleneck in my neural network. So what it actually forces the neural network is to learn more high-level features. Um, and that's something quite useful. So here is how this uh, works. For example, the simplest operator, like a, a max pooling operator, might take a feature map like this uh, and simply for every uh, quadrant pick the maximum value, and that's what you retain. But of course, you can also learn this uh, uh, downsampling operation, because the downsampling operation is in some sense nothing else than, for example, a strided convolution. Okay? So I can also uh, learn, have a parameterized version of this downsampling. Okay? So in this case, it's just another layer in my neural network. Okay? And I can implement things such as uh, averaging, for example, of course, with certain specific weights. Now the final thing is that instead of downsampling, I can also upsample. And you might say, well, hang on, that's, why would I ever want to upsample this as well? Uh, just look at it, because you'll see in a moment why it might be useful. So let's say I have a 3x3 three three feature map. So what I can do is I can upsample it onto a higher resolution feature map. Of course, now, the way I've shown it here, I would have a lot of holes in my feature map. But I can then smooth that resulting uh, feature map with another kernel um, and end up with an upsampled uh, a feature map. So in some sense, this upsampling I can also express as a convolution, as you see here. Correct? And what people call this is, uh, you can sort of, if I picture this here, you can call this uh, 
in many uh, in many people would call this a transposed convolution or a deconvolution. It's clearly not a deconvolution in a signal processing uh, sense, but it's a way of learning how to upsample. Uh, and it might be quite useful. Um, and again, you can express this via kernel and some stride, and you can parameterize this. So you can do whatever you want with these networks, correct? You can upsample, downsample. You have a lot of flexibility. Okay. Uh, yes. And, and really, you can sort of think about this, this upsampling just reversing uh, the downsampling feature map. So let me skip this. Okay. So why, why is this all useful? Well, let's have a look at some applications, some basic network architectures. And you'll be glad to know that you really only need to think of two network architectures, which are really important. This one here is the first one. And this is what most network architectures look like, which do image classification. So it's basically uh, taking input images, which are labeled, it performs some convolutions with its ReLU activations. Then it, for example, performs some pooling operation to get a smaller feature map. Then you keep on doing this, and at the end you typically have these fully connected layers, and you finally threshold your, your classification probability with a softmax, and you get your final label output. Now there are hundreds, millions, hundreds, thousands of different variants of how I build this network, but they all follow roughly the same architecture. And the important thing to realize is that they're basically contracting the information into smaller and smaller pieces of, of, uh, of features, and that forces the network to learn higher, higher level features. So in the early layers, you have low level features, and in the, large, uh, in the later layers, you get exactly what Oscar was er mentioning earlier. You get these high-level features, which are more difficult uh, um, to, to analyze. But finally, you're only going to ma make the classification decisions based on what's here the last layers. Okay? That has to be sufficient to decide whether there's a cat or a dog in the, in the image. So that's one class of network. And the second class of network is, in some variant, uh, looks like this. Um, and it's what we call an image-to-image -image translation network, or some people call it an encoder-decoder network. And there are different architectures for this, but they all follow roughly this architecture I've outlined here. So they basically have the first part uh, copied from the previous slide. And then they just have a symmetric version of doing deconvolution to go back to a full-sized image. Okay? And that is, for example, very useful if you want to label every pixel in this image as, for example, being foreground or background. And so this network architecture has here in the middle something you would call a bottleneck, where you have to squeeze the information through. And many people break this bottleneck by doing something where they introduce uh, shortcuts in the network, which are often called skip layers. So these skip layers connect uh, uh, very low, uh, low or early layers in the network to later layers in the network by bypassing some other layers. Um, but in some form, you always end up with a variant of this. And I've already mentioned to you DeepMedic as one uh, architecture which uses this. Uh, this is the other network which is very commonly used called a fully convolutional network which basically does what I've shown you on the previous slide <coughs> and uh, has been very successful for image segmentation. This is what everybody in the computer vision uh, literature will reference. And um, let me just see where I can Computer just died here. Let me just see what I can. Uh, <laughs> just give me a br give me a second. It wants to update something, which, <laughs> of course, always in the middle of the talk. <coughs> so, should be back now. Um, 
and the second architecture, which people use very often, uh, and they ref they in the medical imaging uh, area will typically uh, reference is something called the UNET, uh, which was proposed by Ronneberger at Mikai uh, a couple of years ago, which uses a very simple, a similar architecture. If you look back to the difference between the two, what this network does, it uh, it only um, up it only up um, upsamples the feature maps. Whereas this network will also upsample uh, your your prediction mass, so this tends to be perhaps a bit better than these fully connected uh, networks. So both of them are used very very frequently. Okay, <clears throat> so the last sort of um, uh, twenty minutes or so, I want to show you just some applications of what you can do with these networks. But perhaps I should. Before I do that, stop here and ask you whether you have any questions so far on, 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 the, on the basics of these convolutional neural networks. Any question? Yes. So let me show you then some applications. Okay. So I sort of um, so I have, I have them in diff four different groups, um, and I hope I'll, I'll be able to show you uh, those very quickly. Okay. So the first one is how can you use this for image reconstruction? Because I've shown you an application to image segmentation, um, but can we also use this for image reconstruction? So. I hope may, some of you will know how we acquire some of these medical images. For example, MR images, we typically measure something called the K-space, so a frequency version, a frequency encoded version of the image. And then we apply a Fourier transform to go back uh, to the original, uh, or no, not to the original image, but we go back to the image. Um, and acquiring this k-space can be very slow because you have to measure every frequency in this k-space and that can take a long time. So what people decided is, well, obviously what I can do is I only measure part of k-space by skipping some of these lines in k-space. And if I only acquire a quarter of the lines, then my image acquisition is four times faster. Great. Um, but if you look at the image, which you get out, you see that the image you get out doesn't look as good as the original image because you've now violated Nyquist sampling theorem. Um, you get all these aliasing artifacts. So we can ask, for example, can we actually recover from this undersampled image the full image content uh, without uh, having to acquire all of K-space? And this is actually an old machine learning problem. It's some of the early versions of this were called compressed sensing, and they're actually used very often. And some of these techniques operate in the k-space domain, and some of them operate in the image domain, and some of them are hybrids. Um, but from a, from a machine learning uh, point of view, what I can simply ask is, well, uh, can I train a neural network which I put the corrupted images in, the aliased images go in, and I'm expecting the network to learn how to de-alias the image. Okay? So that's a very naive approach of doing that, but in principle this is not uh, something you can do. However, it's probably not the best thing uh, to do because it might not be data consistent. So you might get an image out which uh, um, no longer actually uh, corresponds to all the samples you have acquired in k-space. So what you can do instead is you can have a neural network which alternates between k-space and image space. 
Uh, and the way we do this is uh, by having a bunch of layers, which are normal convolutional layers of a CNN, which effectively try to remove the aliasing artifact. However, after we have done this, we take our image, we go back in the k-space domain, and we have something which we call a data consistency layer. We check how consistent our data is with all the measurements we have made in k-space. Um, and uh, we only fill those lines of k-space which, um, which we have not acquired, and then we maintain all the other lines of k-space, or we update them depending on how much noise there is in the model. And so now you have this uh, interleaving of different layers, sort of uh, layers which remove the artifacts, and then layers which enforce data consistency. And if you do this, you can actually be quite aggressive with your undersampling. So what you see on this slide, on the left si side, you see an image being uh, undersampled by a factor of six. This is how the image would look like. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the ground truth. And in the middle, you see the reconstruction from the neural network. Uh, and you can actually do this even more aggressively um, uh, by undersampling by a factor of uh, 11. So this actually works really uh, well in practice. The other question you could, uh, you, the other uh, purpose you could use a neural network for is to, for example, deal with uh, improving the resolution of your data. So, for example, if you acquire cardiac imaging in a clinical setting, you have lots of different constraints, which mean you typically acquire your data as multi slice. So, you acquire one slice, a second slice, a third slice. If you put this all together, um, you actually realize that these slices have a quite high thickness. That means the resolution in plane is quite good, but out of plane uh, is not very good. So if you wanted to have a high resolution volume of data, you could say, well, um, why don't I take some sample data, which is high resolution? Um, and uh, if you ask, why don't I acquire this all the time, if I can acquire this, this requires around 30 seconds breath hold. So that's not going to work for any patient uh, uh, with cardiovascular disease. And then I need some, some low resolution data. Fortunately, I can actually take my high resolution data and I know typically fairly well the forward process for downsampling. So I can model the, the point spread function of the kernel, the slice profile, I can simulate even patient motion. I can downsample my data, and now I have paired data, high resolution, low resolution, and I use a neural network to upsample the data. Okay? So here this neural network is going to try to upsample uh, my data from low resolution to high resolution. Um, and you see also something else in this network. This is what we call a residual network, where actually in, instead of trying to get the network to predict the entire output, I'm only trying to get the network to predict the difference between the input and the output. Because it turns out that the residual, so I can upsample the low resolution image using linear interpolation, and then just get the network to learn the difference between the output of linear, res uh, linear interpolation and super resolution. Okay? And if you do this, uh, surprise, surprise, you can actually get a network to also do this very well. So what you see on the left-hand side, uh, 2D low-resolution uh, images uh, with quite high slice thickness. In the end, then you see linear interpolation, CNN super-resolution, and the ground truth uh, 3D images. So that works as well. And of course, I've already shown you image segmentation. I've already shown you this particular slide. And the nice thing about image segmentation is we used to have to customize an image segmentation algorithm for every task. Now the only thing which changes if I go from the brain to, for example, the heart, is I need another labeled data set. Correct? I'm using exactly the same neural network that tries to segment the heart, which I've used for segmenting the brain, or, for example, for uh, segmenting 
abdominal organs in whole body MRI images. So the only thing you have to do is, um, of course, not to the delight of your clinical collaborators, every time they say, can you do this? You're, you can say, well, okay, so give me 100 labeled images, then I can probably solve this problem. Um, but you can actually uh, do this uh, reasonably well. Okay? So that's quite interesting. So I want to come uh, and show you some, some final applications on image classification and how you can use this for diagnostics. So here is something which we did as part of a project uh, together with King's College um, uh, where we're trying to use uh, um, ultrasound for fetal diagnostics. Um, so we want to really do better fetal screening with ultrasound uh, and this involves a number of of different universities and, and also uh, industry partners. And the idea is, for example, in the beginning, can we, for example, get a neural network to automatically detect what we're actually looking at in an ultrasound uh, image? So, uh, for example, can we identify scan planes? You either might use this for guiding uh, sonographers or training people, uh, or actually having a very automated workflow and reducing variability between operators. So here's a task. Take this ultrasound image. I want to, for example, the neural network to say this is the abdominal view, or this particular ultrasound image, I wanted to say this is a view of the lips uh, of the fetus. And ideally, I also want to have a, a confidence uh, value for this. Okay? So this is what we're trying to do. And obviously, you can do this very easily with the neural network architectures I've shown you before because it's basically doing image classification. So we're using here a neural network um, as one of our postdocs, uh, uh, Christian Baumgartner, who is now at ETH, used to be at King's and then uh, worked at Imperial, came up with this neural network architecture. He wanted to identify 13 different scan planes um, so what we have in this neural network is at the end we have 13 different low resolution feature maps. We then sort of pool them and make the final diagnosis. <clears throat> and we also were quite lucky that we had a lot of training data, more than 2,700 patients. And for each scan plane we had uh, several thousand images. And here's an example of how the output of this uh, looks like. So what you see on the top right is you see that this runs really with nearly 100 frames per second. And here at the bottom you see the probabilities which it predicts for the different scan planes. You can see here this is for example a brain view, a cerebral brain view at the moment. Um, and now it predicts background. <clears throat> and you can basically go through an entire video stream and label every frame in this video stream. But you can also do one more thing. You can actually look at these feature maps and you can actually localize where the organ is. So if you look back at this, uh, these feature maps, as I mentioned to you, we have 13 of these different feature maps. So we can, for example, look at if this frame is labeled as four chamber view, then I can go to the corresponding feature map. I can back propagate uh, through these feature maps to actually produce something which you call a saliency map, which tells you which pixels in the image were actually activate or were activating the output of the neural network. And so what you can do here is you get almost for free the localization of the object, even though during training you don't actually give the system any information where the different organs are. So I just want to show you uh, uh, this as an example. So you see here, um, actually, let me just, oh, hold on, this is probably showing it from the beginning. Let me go a bit further down in the video. Yeah, sorry. So here you see some of the saliency maps, for example, for the spine. You can clearly see that those regions around the spine have activated. This is a four chamber view. So you see the saliency map shows you the four chamber view. Um, and one of the things is, uh, you, after you have produced a saliency map, you can just, for example, threshold this and, for example, automatically place a bounding box 
uh, around uh, the object, okay? And that will tell you where the object is. So you learn this from a lot of training data without even knowing where the object is, okay? Good. Good. I want to show you uh, uh, one, uh, another application where you can use, for example, this machine learning for, for predicting survival in, in patients with heart failure. Uh, for example, what you can do is you can take all the different segmentations um, of every frame together with a uh, motion extraction of the heart. So you have a motion trajectory for every point on the heart. And what you can do is you can put this through a neural network and you can basically say to the neural network, given this input, reconstruct the same output, but I'm only allowing you to use a very small number of, uh, of, of neurons in this hidden layer. So this is something which you call an autoencoder. Uh, so you're basically compressing the information. But in addition, we also ask the, this compressed code to be useful for, for predicting survival uh, for these uh, patients. And so we can use this to build a model which actually is able to predict survival uh, in patients with pulmonary hypertension. And what you see is in the classical sort of survival analysis, you don't get a very good separation between those patients who have a good outcome or a long survival versus poor outcome, whereas with this, this sort of deep learning model, you can separate these two, two groups much better. Okay? So let me just sort of come to the conclusion uh, and sort of show you a bit sort of how the traditional image analysis pipeline has worked very sequential process uh, where I go from acquisition to reconstruction to analysis to interpretation. Um, there isn't much coupling between these different steps. I think in the future you might end up with a much more integrated uh, approach where you have close coupling between these different steps, which has a lot of advantages. Um, and actually each of these steps you can solve with a deep learning neural network. And that means that perhaps really instead of replacing the radiologist, what we might actually ask ourselves is do we actually need to acquire images at all? Can we actually go directly from the acquired data and really optimize that acquired data for making clinically useful uh, diagnostic decisions? And I want to show you, finish with this example where you might actually see that this might be possible. So here's something where we track the heart uh, using segmentation um, and we actually try to do this directly using the case based data and MR scanner acquires and it turns out if we acquire only 20 lines of case space we can still do this very well if we acquire only 10 lines of case space you can no longer really see an image the image at the bottom is only shown is a fully sampled image just for visual inspection and even with one line of case space um, uh, you still track something, but you also now start to see that you get some errors in the tracking. You can no longer track very accurately. Um, and of course, this only works because it's a cine sequence, because I actually have one line of case space for every frame, correct? Uh, but this might be actually an interesting direction to go forward to. So I want to finish here with uh, uh, just an acknowledgement of all the students, postdocs in our group and all our clinical collaborators. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any, any question? Thank you. Very, very nice presentation and uh, highlight a lot of possibilities, actually. I have a question which is not related to the technical possibility, uh, and it is more related to um, interpretability. You started your presentation uh, showing uh, newspapers, somehow talking about uh, um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. There was one title from BBC News this year that was called, uh, I'm quoting, Machine Learning Causing Science Crisis. I don't know if you know the title. No, I haven't seen that. Uh, uh, that. I just resume a bit the <laughs> article. Yeah. It was uh, 
clearly not talking about the technical capability, but the idea that users are not trained anymore to understand what is happening. So they can uh, mm, give, uh, they, they just take for uh, granted what they receive from the, the technique. And this, of course, can create troubles. Moreover, it was published on a, a journal which is not a scientific one, so it's a tax-paying society. Can you comment on this? Oh, I think I think I think that's a very good uh, good point, and I think, for example, in in many decisions, many things such as the last couple of applications which I showed, where you, for example, predict survival of of patients with heart failure, it becomes very very difficult if you don't have a system which is interpretable, correct? Because I cannot really make a predict. I I cannot explain to you what the neural network does in some sense. Um, However, I think for some tasks, for example, these purely perceptual tasks, I think the, these, these machine learning approaches are ideally suited because if, if the segmentation is not interpretable, I don't really care because I can look at the final result and I can actually say, yes, I've segmented this correctly or not. I don't really care whether it's a black box system or not. But in many other applications, I care about the black box system. Of course, what I cannot really guarantee you at the moment, or nobody can do, is, for example, if you have an autonomous driving car, that I can always detect a pedestrian. Correct? I, don't, I have no way of giving you a formal guarantee that if there's a face in the image, that I would detect it. Because if you see what happened with a Tesla autopilot, if there's a sunlight in the background, uh, it might not work. So. I think interpretability is very important for A, for helping us in areas where we don't, wouldn't accept a black box decision, or it's very useful in things which we're, where we need to verify a safety critical system, correct? But in some sense, many of the, in medical imaging, many of the tasks we have are quite tedious tasks which a radiologist at the moment does, where it's actually very simple to visually verify the results. And I think for that, these neural networks are really, really good. In the other areas, I think we still need to figure out how do we verify these neural networks or any machine learning algorithm for that, for that purpose. Thank you. OK, I, I have a question about the very last slide you showed about the case space. Maybe it's a bit uh, specific, but uh, do you need some latent representation for the images? Yes. So, so, so the, so the, this is not a s simple neural network, but it's uh, we basically uh, first train the network with uh, with segmentations, which it expects to see. For example, how does the shape of the heart look like? We build a latent representation from that, and then we're forcing our network to predict from the case space data that latent representation code. So, uh, yeah, so if you look at, the, at this reference here, with the network architecture we have is something which we call a TL network. So there's one part which is effectively an autoencoder, forcing the network to learn a latent code, and then the inverted T branch is sort of a, a prediction network which tries to predict from case space that latent code. You're absolutely right. So very quick, great talk. I guess based on this slide as well, that is outstanding. You know, it's astonishing that you know maybe five years ago this was an unthinkable problem to solve. Where do you see the next challenges? I mean, based on this, that you might argue you are kind of redefining image acquisition at large. Where where do you think? Where do you see the next challenges in five years? Well, so I think I, I think the one of the challenges is what you mentioned <coughs> earlier because. The problem here is if I, pre if I, for example, no longer reconstruct an image at the same time, let's say I only reconstruct your segmentation, how do you know that that segmentation is trustworthy? Correct? How do you know that? So I think one of the big challenges in all of this is to have a way of doing actually a more Bayesian approach where we can actually quantify the uncertainty. So <clears throat> I wouldn't mind if I don't know the image uh, I only get a segmentation, but I also have a probability that actually this is the right segmentation. And if it's not the right segmentation, um, I, I can acquire a conventional acquisition. The other thing which I think is also interesting is 
to have basically steerable acquisitions where you, for example, acquire, I mean, an MR scan as a programmable device in some sense. Why don't I collect more and more data until I've actually reduced my uncertainty to, a certain, to an acceptable level? And um, in some cases, I might have a very fast acquisition, and in some, I might have a slower acquisition. But so I think having this idea of an active scanner, uh, active acquisition, or having a sort of Bayesian uh, uh, un uncertainty quantification, I think are the text, two next big challenges I see. Yep, one. Yeah, I had one before, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just a, just a good question. So, um, one of the big criticisms is the, the black box uh, thing, yeah? So, everybody says, well, this is a black box. So, one of the directions is interpretability, but that kind of kicks the, the question to the user, yeah? So, the user has to validate if this is realistic or not. But the other direction is kind of formal conditions, mathematical conditions. Like when you have, you mentioned compressed sensing for reconstruction, but there there are conditions, mathematical formulations like Candes and, and people for perfect reconstruction, same as you have for wavelets and whatever. Yeah, and and it's a bit the equivalent of Nyquist theorem for this type of formalisms, and this is a bit missing here. So uh, I mean, this example with one lay line of case space, um, I'm sorry. I mean, you you cannot trust that if you have a patient and you acquire one line of case space, even doesn't matter how realistic this is. No, it's, it's not usable. realistic, it's correct? A, no, no, it's so, so, but, but there are people I know that are working on this type of formalism, so, so I don't know if you, you have any... Yes, actually, that's a very good point. Actually, um, I'm going on, on the weekend to CVPR, and they have a workshop on verification of CNNs. So, for example, what formal guarantees can I give for a CNN, for example, that it gives me the same output if I, for example, do a, let's say I define a class of transformations on my image, which I want to have uh, complete invariance to in terms of the output. And, for example, there are some pieces of work which says, actually, I can take this neural network and I can formulate a mixed uh, integer linear programming problem from that, where I can sort of give you guarantees when the network will do something. However, Every time you see this in practice, is A, it's not scalable. Nobody can actually deal with a real world, real sized network. And the second thing is the guarantees are going to be so weak because we know these neural networks are not, uh, they're easy to fool in some sense, correct? So I'm not sure that even if, even if you have a formal way of, of, of proving something, that I think you will always see that actually your neural, you will not meet any guarantees because the neural network will always. The input space is so large that the neural network will always, you always find an example, which, a counter example, which makes it break. So I think we should, I completely agree and we need to do this, but um, I'm a bit skeptical that, that unless you go down the Bayesian route, you will really learn something. Because I think you need to just live with the fact that you will have some failures, but you will need to quantify what the failure mode is. It's partially related to this. You probably know about the infamous experiment where they drawn a gorilla in a CT scan and many radiologists would not see it. So what you didn't train for, you don't recognize. How is this in this area? I think it's exactly the, the same. So, for example, in the, in the earlier reconstruction work, we would basically have this data consistency term to sort of try to mitigate this. The other thing which I haven't shown you is, so clearly this is a sort of an example which is unrealistic and over the top, just to illustrate that you might actually go to a different paradigm. On the reconstruction work, we, for example, actually tried out what happens if you train on natural images instead of cardiac MR. So, or for example, on knee MR instead of uh, a cardiac MR. And it turned out when you train on ImageNet, because you have millions of images, the performance is slightly better than when you train on cardiac images. So there's so much variability in the training set that actually I would argue you have not learned anything about, the cardi about cardiac MR images. You've only learned something about low-level features because otherwise, how can I reconstruct a cardiac MR from pictures of faces and cars and, and, and landscapes? So I think... Um, Carefully analyzing what bias your training set basically will impose on you is very important. 
And I think it's part of the sort of uh, un part of the route to unlocking that secret. But um, I, I couldn't give you any other other answer at the moment. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah.